So welcome, everybody. This is the August 8th, 2024 meeting of the Healthy Climate Change Committee. Do you want to do the minutes? Calling the meeting to order. Oh. And we will go to minutes for minutes approval. So have you all had an opportunity to take a look at the minutes? Yes. Kathy, thank you so much for typing them up. There was a lot You're welcome. in there. Yeah. So would somebody here like to make a motion to approve those minutes? I'll make a motion. Okay. I'll second. All right. And the vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Um, Michael Doctor is out today. He's traveling. And Catalina just mentioned that she was sick. So she won't be joining us today. And I guess Jane is coming. I guess not. That's too bad because I have the science to share later. All right, so today we're very lucky to have Claire Morano, um, Communication Director of CESA, who's joining us today. And, you know, you work with lots of local farmers. And this is a farming town in addition to, you know, being lots of other things, but there's lots of people um, who work on farms and have been impacted by the weather. Yeah. Uh, and we're hoping that you would share some of your experiences. I do want to let you know that this is recorded on Hadley Media, great. so this will get out to a wider audience, which is a great thing. And if you would just share a little bit about your experience. Yeah. Um, so I told Jack when he invited me to come talk to you all. Uh, so I'm the communications, I lead our communications team at CESA. Um, so I have coworkers who are much more involved with the farmer technical assistance side of our climate change work, and I think some of them have come and spoken to this group in other meetings. Um, my side of CESA's work is more focused on what we're saying to the general public um, about local farms and the food system more broadly. So I figured this might be an opportunity to just come share some of the things that we're thinking about, some of our, our questions, some of the things we're grappling mm -hmm. with. Like this feels kind of like a growing edge for us at CESA. Um, and, and Claire, was your letter from maybe three weeks ago in yeah. the Daily Hampshire Gazette that kind of inspired the invitation? Yeah, so I thought like this is a group of people who are thinking about climate change and how it's impacting your community and maybe you'll have some brilliant insights for me about, <laughs> about this issue. Um, so I think People, do, do you all feel like you have a pretty decent sense of what CESA does? Would it be helpful for me to give a quick rundown of our work? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is our website. CESA stands for Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture. We're a nonprofit. Uh, we're, we're based in South Deerfield, and we work throughout Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden counties. So just in the sort of Connecticut River Valley region of Western Mass. Um, and our work has a couple of different areas of focus. The sort of core of our work and the section that has the most staff dedicated to it is behind the scenes farmer technical assistance. So we provide all sorts of business supports to local farms, um, whether they need help with grant writing or business planning or financial management or marketing, like a lot of those sort of basic business skills that they need to survive. Um, as successful businesses, we provide expert technical assistance sometimes funding, we can connect people to um, resources to help them strengthen their businesses. We've recently added a climate change focus to our technical assistance program. So my coworker Stephen, who I think came and spoke to this group earlier in the spring, he's-, he's He attended the, our um, co-sponsored yeah. farmer and climate change committee gathering yes. at Plainville Farm. Great, yeah. Um, he's the person who leads our climate change work and so we've expanded the assistance that we're able to offer to farmers to help them adapt to climate change. So sometimes that takes the form of helping them access infrastructure, like funding, or you know, expert help on infrastructure infrastructure improvements. Um, so you know, farms have been installing like huge fans to keep the frost from settling on their fruit crops early in the season, or greenhouses so that they have more covered growing space where they can manage the climate swings that people are seeing yeah. more of, or manage disease pressure, that sort of thing. So some of it is that, and then some of it is focused more on growing practices. Um, and that can take the form of helping farmers think through what their crop plans might be with increased risk of flooding, um, or experimenting with something like low or no-till 
farming, which can help them manage water in their mm-hmm. soil. You know, it's a whole range, a whole huge range of potential adaptations that farmers can experiment with, and we are committed to trying to help them do that. Um, we are partners on a new project that is housed at PASA, which is a Pennsylvania-based organization. It's a big regional pro- uh, project that is providing funding for farmers to implement something like 50 or 55 climate-smart um, growing practices. And the idea is to provide funding to help farmers make changes on farm to their systems, um, and then it's part of a big regional research project that will help identify which of those um, adaptations uh, are feasible in terms of long-term you know, business adoption. And I think that there was originally an element of trying to research how effective they are for climate change mitigation. Yeah, that would make sense. I'm not sure how much that, you know, this is a big, multi-partner project I, and I think that some of the details of how it's going to play out are still being determined. And who's it funded by? That's what I was going to ask. It's a USDA um, program. So CESA is also? We are a partner uh, agency so we're like there are regional partners all around the Northeast um, and Mid-Atlantic that are sort of the go-betweens that are helping farmers access the funds and implement the projects on their farms. Um, Is there a CESA sort of Boston or middle mass? There are other bi-local organizations in, throughout the state, um, and they vary quite a bit in terms of what exactly they look like and what they're focused on. Um, so there's Central Mass Grown. Boston has a number of sort of urban agriculture projects. Um, there's a sustainable business ne- network, which does a lot of work with local farms. There isn't exactly a CESA you know, corollary in Boston. Um, but I would say pretty much the whole state, I think, is covered by some organization or another that has some element of a bi-local effort. They don't all necessarily provide the same level of technical assistance that CESA does. Mm-hmm. Um, so and so, so um, I just want to make sure I yeah. understand. So CESA is funded by USDA or? Our, yeah, well, we, um, we're sub-grantees on this particular project. So our funding comes from a variety of sources. Um, we do get funding through federal and state grant programs, mm-hmm. and those vary quite a bit in terms of what they fund and how big they are and all of that. Um, we get funding through foundations, you know, private grantees, and individual donations. And then we also have a membership program. Um, so the Local Hero Campaign is a membership program, and there are dues from that as well. Sounds like so much work to stay funded. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. So do you have people that that's what they do to yeah. apply for grants? We have fundraising staff um, who mostly do donor um, outreach. And then we also have program staff who do a lot of our program design, program oversight, and figuring out what it is that we're going to do and how to make sure that it's effective. And then they also manage a lot of our grants and apply and look for funding. So yeah, it's it's a lot. What a great organization. It's quite varied, yeah. Um, so I think I mean that's one thing for just this group to know about is this PASA project. My coworker Stephen, who I think you have his contact info, um, is the contact person for that. If you want to connect farmers, what is that called PASA? Yeah, P A S A is the acronym oh, for the P A S A. Yeah. And who's the the contact person? It's Stephen Toronto oh, okay. and S T E P H E N at bilocalfood.org is his contact. T O T A Toronto. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting <coughs> because at the farmer round table they were talking about concerns about flooding and yeah, controlling the dams. That was a really hot issue. And what they found is a lot of the dams, because it's a money making operation, um, aren't necessarily checking in with all the farmers. We're paying because, attention to the weather. Well, I think they're paying attention because they'll see how much electricity they can generate, but they're not necessarily driving their levels of water. That's what I meant, to they, just try to yeah. control it. So that was that. a bit of a surprise yeah. when I guess they met with Senator Comerford and mm-hmm. a few others about yeah. that. Yeah, I haven't heard much about where that discussion has gone. 
Um, I remember people talking about that last year. But yeah. It seems that there are some dams that are strictly controlled with water diversion mm -hmm. and others that are in it to make money right. Right. Yeah. and to make electricity. Yeah, it'd be interesting to learn more about that. Um, but yeah, so this, this program is focused really on like on-farm climate smart. That's the term that they're using, climate smart farming practices. And it, good. it really covers a wide, wide range of um, changes that farmers can make. So, you know, I mentioned no-till. It can cover fencing to allow for different management of livestock, like all, all sorts of different things. Um, so the technical assistance is a really big part of what CISA does, and farm adaptation is really central to our climate change technical assistance work. Um, we also do a lot of work that's focused on both promotion of local food and local farms and public consumer education about our local food system and the challenges that local farms face and some of the like sticky nuances of why all this is so complicated. And that's um, part of what my job is, is thinking about how are we talking about these issues to the public. Um, and that's what our Be a Local Hero, Buy Locally Grown campaign is focused on, is you know promotion, making sure people know what's in season, where you can go get it. Um, and something that we have been grappling with a lot is what is like true and meaningful and um, effective to be saying to the general public about climate change and how it's affecting farms. Um, within the context of the rest of our work. And so that's what I figured I would just share some of my thinking about that. Um, and I'm curious to hear what you all think about it. I guess I should also say CESA does also have um, some specific programming that's focused on food access. We do some advocacy and policy work, like just to, that's not strictly relevant here, but just to the gamut of what we do is we're really focused on building a stronger, more resilient food system with vibrant agriculture at the center of it. Um, so that includes a lot of different areas of work. So when it comes to the sort of climate change communications piece, we talk a lot about when it makes sense to be focusing on adaptation and when it makes sense to be thinking about mitigation. And the adaptation piece feels pretty straightforward um, to communicate about. Not, <laughs> I'm not saying it's straightforward to manage, but in terms of what the message is and what we want people to understand, that feels clear. You know, everybody saw the impacts of the flooding last year. I, I think my coworker Margaret was like, I think this might be the year where people really understand that this is happening now. Like it is, climate change is here and it's affecting our daily lives, you know? Um, because we had that devastating flooding that was on the tail of a number of frost events that damaged yeah. fruit crops. It was, really it was just, year. yes, and then just rain throughout the whole rest of the season. So it wasn't just river flooding, it was like just a washout for a lot of farms. Um, and so there's a lot of room to be communicating to the general public a number of things about that. There's, you know, talking about how we need to support grant programs and technical assistance for farmers so that they can implement changes on their farms to help them adapt. Um, one really important example of that is the state FSIG program, the Food Security Infrastructure Grants. They're not specifically what only for the food, food Security Infrastructure Grant program. Um, that was implemented during COVID to help build a more resilient food system in Massachusetts. So it funds farms, it also funds you know, distribution companies and grocery stores and everyone that has a role to play in making sure that our food system is secure. Um, and one piece of what it can do is fund climate adaptations. And um, where, what, is this a federal program? It's a state program. So the state is funding? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's through the Department of Ag Resources. And we have, you know, at CISA, we provide a lot of support to farms who need help figuring out, um, who need help with their applications in various ways, either framing them appropriately or just help with editing, that sort of thing. We've done a fair amount of that each year. Um, so, you know, trying to encourage public support of programs like that and making sure that people know, like, 
even in the wake of a disaster, farms still need your support. Like yeah. your favorite orchard might not have peaches this year. I mean, this was last year. Last mm -hmm. year they do have, this year they do have peaches, but, um, but you know, you can still go and support them and buy their apples, you know, that sort of thing. So there, it feels like there's um, an important message there. And I think the place that we get into a little bit less clarity and a little more stickiness is when we're talking about what f local farmers' roles might be in climate change mitigation. Um, and I think that's because there's a lot of research that hasn't really been done yet about you know, the nitty gritty of how individual farming practices in our like tiny, tiny little slice of agriculture here compared to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Um, and yeah, trying to figure out sort of how we can encourage customers to make choices that feel like they're in alignment with their values, which is a really big part of, I think, what draws people to buying local. Um, but doesn't sort of place the whole like climate solution on the backs of local farms, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, sort of trying to balance those um, various considerations. So we've seen a number of farms who are trying to make changes to their growing practices with an eye towards climate change mitigation, just for their own values, like wanting to align their own practices with what feels um, like meaningful and good to them. And that is great, like wonderful. And I think a lot of our climate technical assistance can definitely support that. And there's no, no tension there whatsoever. Um, we've started to hear from some farmers who are looking for support, communicating to their own customers what it is that they're doing, like how they're adapting or how they're thinking about climate change mitigation. Um, and that's work that we're able to do on a sort of individualized basis. The, possibilities for what farmers can do are so varied it doesn't feel like there's kind of a one-size-fits-all message there I, I would think it's very like i mean hat, very regional and you know yeah. very personal kind yes of, you know. yeah and there are a lot of buzzwords it's like you know people talk a lot about regenerative regenerative agriculture which is a phrase that has meaning but you know, how well consumers understand what it means and how... What does that mean? Well, it refers to... <laughs> I mean, I think I know, but just tell me anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of another word for, like, sustainable. It's, you know, it's agriculture that... Um, oh, I hate that word, sustainable. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's agriculture that's thinking about the overall inputs and outputs in a way that ba keeps those in balance. Like, doesn't take more from the larger system than it puts out. But what it looks like can vary quite a bit. And you might think of a farm like Barstow's, Longview Dairy, that they really look at inputs and outputs in uh -huh. what they're doing. Like growing their own. Well, I'm even thinking. Yeah. The biodigester. Yeah. Oh, right. The biodigester. Right. Or yeah. cars. Um, Cider House. Is, yeah. Cider House, they're doing a lot of like um, sil what's called silva pasturing where they're. In between their apple apple trees, they're, they're growing other things. They're so. actually um, uh, they have a chickens? herd of sheep. Okay. They so also they, have so chickens. So they're partnering yeah. with sheep farmers. So instead of having to like um, run the mower in between or do whatever yeah. they do, Wait, the sheep are taking care of it. Sense. What? It sounds like common sense. It, yeah, yeah, but. Well, I think, gotten away from it, though. Yeah. yeah, I think a big part of the issue is, and this is something that we think a lot about at CESA, is that so many farms are running on such incredibly narrow margins in terms of like how much it costs to farm and what their y yield is, um, that even systems like that, which seem like, oh, how straightforward and simple, can be really costly to implement. Well, then you have to be taking care of the sheep. Yes. Yeah. You want to like, just get sheep so that they can eat. I mean, you right, need the right. whole thing, right. having sheep for the wool or whatever, and well, yeah. like being a sheep farmer with also. Sheep farmers. So right. They're uh, not, that's they're not totally running the sheep sense. operation. Right. Or goats. But it tends to collaboration. Yeah. 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 And depending on what the sheep farmers, you know, earlier systems might have looked like, that might be a lot more management for them, like moving fencing around and, you know, keeping track of. Um, like moving the flock enough that they're not overgrazing, right. you know. Yeah, um, and that's a wonderful example. 
Yes. But right, but the sheep right. farmer then has to have the way to transport their sheep right. to different farms right. Right. to exactly. do the yeah. right. grass eating. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Saves them, gives the sheep something to eat, but then yeah. you need trucks. Yeah. And so that, I mean, I think that is a really good example of exactly the sort of like, how do we talk about all this stuff in a way that doesn't, like, I don't know. Overwhelm? Well, I guess maybe in a way that sort of keeps in balance the like, okay, so we have many farmers who are, depending on what their business looks like and depending on how the years have been, um, like, they're able to keep going, but they don't necessarily have the funds to, like, just scrap what they're doing and try a whole new system. <laughs> or there can be room for a little bit of experimentation around the edges, but trying a whole new setup for how they manage their animals or how they manage their crops is a really costly thing to do. So it's it's kind of this tension for us of like, how do we support them in making those changes, make it possible for that research to happen so that people have more information about what's feasible without setting up a consumer expectation that like, oh, it's, you know, of course everybody should be doing this. Of course, you know, like no, this is. Expensive. So yeah. that's part of what you do is you have funding to help them. Yeah, yeah, but you know, that's all relatively recent um, and I think it does feel like there are a lot of farmers who have been experimenting with different systems um, without institutional support. So I'm certainly not saying it's not possible. Like many farms are, are doing a lot of different things. A Starte farm right here in Hadley is a, I think, no-till or low-till operation. Yeah. They've been doing that for years. Um, so it's, I think kind of what I'm saying is like, it varies so much <laughs> depending yeah. on what's feasible for different types of business models. Um, for different land bases, for the financial situation that different farms are in, um, whether you're renting your land or you own it, that can be a huge determining factor in what's possible. You know, a lot of the sort of permaculture models are decade-long investments, um, and if you're renting your land or if you don't have a stable land base, it's, it's not really going to be possible to put that much investment into something. So anyway, I, I know I sound super negative. I, I feel like there's so much possibility. No, it just sounds very realistic. Yeah. There's, like you really get it. Like, it feels like, yeah, it feels like there's so much possibility for what farmers might be able to do in the future. And so we're sort of in a place of figuring out how do we talk to consumers about that and talk to consumers about like all these really amazing possibilities and what farmers are already doing without sort of setting up um, consumer expectations in a way that's like not connected to reality. Like one example, I think every pig farmer has had people ask if their pigs are grass fed, which they aren't because pigs are not ruminants. Like that is not, they, ca they, they can't right. be. They're not grazing fed. with the cows. They're not cows. Like they're, their biology is different. And I think that's a great example of how there are so many people, especially I think here in the valley, which is part of what makes it so great a place to farm, people who really want to be making choices that are responsible, that consider the environment, that consider people who grow the food, um, and also so much of this stuff is so nuanced that like expecting people to know every detail of like every, you know, possible growing practice is kind of impossible. So how do we give people information that they can use? Well, and why do everyday people even, would, why would they even care? Well, yeah, I think there are a lot yeah. of people who just, it's not their primary concern. I think the, the, the yeah. buy local thing, I love seeing those bumper stickers because that's what really makes a difference. I brought some. Them. If you want one, please oh, do. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so, on this funny. idea, you know, one reason, the season has been pretty reasonable at the start this year. Yeah. Not bad. But so lately, we've been getting about an inch of rain every other, every third day. Yeah. It's a stunning amount, and mm. the plants just can't handle it in yeah. so many ways. I can tell that there's a change the last few <coughs> days because I smell the rotting leaves yeah. when I'm out there involved in tobacco. Yeah. I just take a whiff, and all of a yeah. sudden, it's like, this is scary. And um, you, I'm working with Wally, my brother, and you know he can put in fungicides or other things and spray and kind of control some of these diseases. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what's happening with the organic farmers and how they're making it through these times. That's if, what I was if wondering. If they can't do some of these other mitig mitigators. Yeah. Well, there are organic certified applications that people can use for different, you know, for pests and. All right. um, 
plant diseases and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that probably like the main difference is that organic agriculture is a lot more labor intensive. Like you just need hand work um, where you otherwise might be able to rely more on other inputs. Yeah. Um, and in some contexts, the losses might just be greater, like the yields might be lower, depending on what your system is. I don't think that's universally true, um, but depending on how the season shakes out and, you know, what yeah. some of Well, I was is. wondering, yeah. at this point, are you hearing from different farmers, are there certain vegetables that are really, like, not doing well from all this rain, or is everybody kind of yeah. okay it's so like far? tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, all the things that are, like, Right, right now, or probably struggling. My tomatoes are looking. And the squash. Yeah, my cherry yeah. tomatoes aren't doing. They're just mm -hmm. not doing. Much. Splitting. And the squashes, yeah. and I wonder about the potatoes too, because something that's ground, sitting, sitting in wet water. dirt for yeah. weeks or months. Yeah, that's what it's I was. It's going to be a real struggle, but I worry a lot about the squash. Yeah. Squash plants. Well, um, my coworker Stephen shared. This is old, and this is from like a week or two ago. But we actually, even though we did have quite a bit of rain, like these big heavy rainstorms throughout the month of July, we still were in like a near drought um, status because of the heat. Because um, drought is not just about um, rainfall, it's also about evaporation. Right. And so in a circumstance where we have a lot of these big wild storms dumping huge amounts of rain, but then also these wild heat, yeah. heat periods. 90s and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that feels, to me, that feels very unusual. Um, I mean, it well, is. it was early, so early for to be yeah. having 90s in, in July. Yeah. Usually that doesn't happen until August. Right. And so, so many of them, like it was just yeah. hot for so long and like not cooling off overnight. But anyway, I mean that that whole system contributed to, I think, I'm not exactly sure what the designation is, but like near drought status, even though it felt like, but it keeps raining. It's been raining every day. Um, now I, you know, it's cooled off over the last few days um, and it has been wet. I, ha I haven't heard like, oh, that's the end of any particular like the potatoes are just done. Yeah, or, I haven't yeah, heard anything like that's that. Good. I think that overall, my sense is that it's been a, a pretty strong year. Um, I think that the main issue, I don't know what, I don't want to say what the main issue is. One big issue that we've had our eye on is the impact that excessive heat has on people who are oh, working right. in, on farms and working in fields, um, which is a climate change impact that has yeah. big yeah. <laughs> consequences for farmers. Um, that is a little different than the sort of what does it mean for their crops, yeah. what does it mean for their farm viability, but certainly impacts the people who are working. So, so how do you measure that? How do you evaluate? Well, because it um, sure has been toasty this summer. Uh, yeah. Well, you really have to be careful because the human body can only take so much. Yes. Heat. Like it's not a matter of just toughing it out. It's right. Like no, we're not get machines. into the shade. Yeah. Like this is too hot on your yeah. brain. Yeah. The work has to happen. I understand that. Yeah. It's, I, I, I used to do landscaping and I would push myself mm -hmm. to, like at noon, I'm still out there in August. And yeah. I, I would end up in somebody's yard just putting the hose on my head. It's like <laughs> something bad is happening. My brain's getting too hot. Yeah. And I, now I'm reading about it and it was like true. I wasn't imagining it. It's like yeah. you really, like your body starts to not work right. It's not good for you. We've been doing a series of listening sessions um, in partnership with the Pioneer Valley Workers Center to try to get a sense of like, how is this playing out on local farms and how are farm workers being affected by the weather and are planning to do some kind of educational sessions around how to keep workers safe. And I mean, owners too, I mean, anyone who's out working in the field, um, how to keep people safe as the climate changes and as we can expect much hotter summers and much higher humidity. Um, but I mean, you know, last summer it rained and it wasn't a hot, it, like, it's just so variable. I think that's really... Well, I think that's it. People have to be ready to respond. Like I'm thinking when we have these heat flashes, like maybe don't work in the middle of the day. You know, start early, 
quit in the middle and, and then work till dark. Well, I think quite a few farmers follow that. In Absolutely. Yeah. They'll go to six o'clock starting times and yeah. right. longer yeah. breaks, or that's when you can yeah. be packing things inside mm -hmm. of a barn in the shade. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it makes it hard when there's more and more hot days. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you're seeing the trends, and later on I can call it up on here, you know, since like the 1940s is just getting hotter and hotter and hotter. It's trending that way. It's not right. just a single data point. Right. It really is moving in sort of this red direction when they do the blue and red stripes yeah. and they're measuring the heat. Right. It, it's really noticeable. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, making sure people have ample access to water and access to shade and are able to take breaks and that sort of thing. You know, I mean, historically there have not really been legal protections for not just farm workers, but people who are working outside. Like there isn't like a state guideline around what's required of employers. Um, and that's something that seems like it's part of the national discussion around climate change. Um, and certainly- And really like the action needs to happen. I mean, people, I, I can't even imagine like not providing water for your workers and stuff. Yeah. Well, it's even more extreme in the Floridas and the Carolinas yes. and some of the other places. I cannot imagine right. working through the summer in Florida. Right. It just or seems, Arizona. Or Texas. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. brutal. Um, but yeah, I mean, it certainly is an issue that is if it, not as intense as it is in other parts of the country, but certainly is present here. So right, how do we, so much of this is like, how do we balance the sort of seasonal nature of agricultural work, the fact that there's so much that needs to happen in such a compressed period of time with just like the human body's <laughs> needs um, because people who are working outdoors are humans, you know, with fallible bodies and deserve to be safe doing that, so. So it's been super informative hearing about the work that is doing. What are some things that a climate change type of committee can do to help with this? That's a great, I don't, I don't think I, I don't have a ready answer. I don't think I, I'm curious to hear just a little more about what you all have been focused I, on. I think we've been doing it. I mean, yeah. we had like the farmers forum or whatever we called okay. it. That, was, that was a good one. And I'm glad that Steve could attend. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, so many farmers showed up and a, and a lot of, um, you know, like technical people, like mm -hmm. you guys, all kinds of yeah. people. Show. Well, would you estimate it 50, 60 mm -hmm. people at mm -hmm. the farm forum? Mm -hmm. It was also a good time. It was early in the year. Yeah, yeah. Right, that seems like an example. I mean, like partnering with organizations like us to host events that mm -hmm. um, provide educational opportunities to farmers. Like, yeah, that seems like a great example. Um, yeah, and it sounds also like um, also communication with the public. Right. That's yeah, how much is that part of this group's charter? Um, I'm, it, there's no maybe. doubt it figures in. I mean, we broadcast every meeting to make this public to share the word and all that. But yeah, I think... I mean, a couple of years ago, we did like a climate day expo thing and had... Right. Speakers here on important, talk, you know, like super qualified people from yeah. your mass and stuff to talk about yeah. different things. We held it here. Yeah. Oh, this nice. was a great setting for it. And your background, you've done sort of farm type work. How would you describe it? Mary? What? The, the no, your background in some of the farm work you've done in the past? I'm mostly a teacher and just do some gardening. Okay. I was rounding up. <laughs> <laughs> and Kathy With a little bit of permaculture, you know, I got my perma permaculture design certificate, but that's like that's just a little, yeah. yeah. Just and becoming a, aware of different ways of gardening. And Kathy, do you have some farming background? Through my husband's family, for the most part. And okay. I didn't know if you were out there in the gardening. fields or things like that. Oh, oh yes. I was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is one thing we all have that, yeah. you know, which is valuable to have that definitely first-hand perspective. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and making sure that you know this group knows about resources that are available to farmers. Like obviously there are so many farms in Hadley, and you know at CISA we have connections to many of the farms in the region. But just having duplication out there of like who's spreading the word and making sure people know 
what resources exist feels very important. So, this is also a little bit of an aside, but I'll mention it. Um, there's a new committee that has just formed in Hadley, the Smart Growth mm -hmm. um, Committee, and a lot of it is is focused on trying to figure out ways to provide housing, mm. more housing. There's obviously a demand mm -hmm. uh, all over. Everywhere. Oh, everywhere. Yeah. Um, but doing it in a smart way, which mm -hmm. means not building on prime farmland yeah. and protecting farmland. Um, so that also feels like a really important element or connection. Yes. Um, raising awareness about protecting, continuing to protect our farmland because we're like the bread basket of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Are you on that committee or involved? No, in but a friend of mine is. Okay. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, that seems so. Important. Did you see the survey? I did. Okay. Did yeah. you see the survey? No. So through the water, th through your water and sewer bill, inside the water and sewer bill is a separate little oh, sheet. Oh, that's what out the QR code. Yeah. Do do it. I mean, it's a. Well, I don't get a water and sewer bill, but okay, he was asking me. Since I live in senior housing, last night he was asking me, uh -huh. how can I distribute the survey there? So I yeah. Yeah, so I'll get it. Okay. Okay. But for those of us who pay our water bill by September 2nd, we have that little yellow card where they have a QR, QR code, code where we can hop onto the survey. I wonder which there's a link through the town website also. Th yeah. They do, yeah. absolutely. Oh, like you can go to the town website? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's... Yeah. A committee under the planning board, maybe it's a little I, bit buried in there. That would make yeah. sense. Yeah. So just thinking, mm. you know, co connecting. Smart. That's like mm. yeah the intersectional aspect of all of this. Yeah, I could also imagine. I mean, you know, something that CISA does as needed is, you know, it's not unheard of for there to be a super localized issue that pops up somewhere like a particular farm is having challenges with their you drainage know, for example <laughs> for example yeah. yeah their local board of health or a neighbor conflict or something like that and it seems like having town committees that are available to contact when an issue like that comes up seems really important um and yeah i'm not sure their agricultural committees that might be a little bit more targeted. Um, but it seems like the climate change committee might have relevance sort of like on an on-call basis when there are particular conflicts. I think in this town people tend to go to the select board. Select board, yeah. Don't you think? I think so. That's yeah. safe to say, and it's interesting how much the drainage issue came up in this mm -hmm. meeting about yeah. farm issues and climate change. Right. It was a big deal for many yes. farmers. You know the valley pretty well, and you know how unique Hadley is, where mm -hmm. some fields are sandy mm -hmm. and some fields are clay and really thick and heavy and don't drain well. Yeah. It's just a, a unique town right. for that. Right. Yeah, I mean, it seems like water is going to be the big yep. challenge. Yeah. In one way or another, for agriculture, just like from like now on, yeah, too much or too little, um, and it seems like the trends are pointing towards too much more often. Than I, one thing I was reading about a while back are cisterns. Are, are people take farmer any farmers taking any steps to try to um, you know hold on to some of that extra water and use it when they need it? I haven't heard about people building cisterns. But there are many farms around here who have little ponds and other things, and they'll yes. often draw for irrigation mm -hmm. yeah. um, on those. That seems like a smart thing to do, even if you don't have one, maybe now's the time to dig one. Well, there was a fellow up on Mount Warner who actually dug out, you know, he got some grants. Eddie Grilinski and you know dug out his pond mm -hmm. and now he can irrigate from it if yeah. he needs to. My sense which is I mean none of this is universally true but my sense is that um, when we are in a drought it's not necessarily that people don't have any access to water like that there is just not enough water it's about having the infrastructure in place to get it to the, the fields right. that need it. And that is really what is so costly. Like an irrigation system. Yeah, yeah, having an irrigation system. I remember, I don't know, I feel like every year over the last few years, it's been like, oh, the worst drought we've ever seen. Oh, the wettest season we've ever seen. The worst, you know, it's been flip-flopping. A couple of years ago, 
Um, I remember a drought year where the people who were hit hardest were like livestock farmers because they don't historically irrigate hay fields. Um, or corn fields. Or corn, right. Any Not feed. around here. Yeah, it yeah. just hasn't really been needed and it's really costly to cover that much ground and for a crop that's like itself relatively low value compared to something that you might be selling directly to consumers like if you're growing an input yourself um it's lower value until you need to buy it all in you know and so it, i think that the challenge there that i heard the most about was not so much like there's no water access it's like how do we get it to all the places that we need it um and then you know now that we're in a situation where it seems like the sort of overarching biggest impact of climate change is just total unpredictability and extremes. So you have to be prepared for both. You have to be prepared for both. And it's like, there's not, <laughs> like, that's not. Yeah. That's um, why I was wondering about ponds or cisterns, like, because we're getting hit with both. Yeah. Right. And who knows, as it gets more extreme, there might be an actual, like, we do not have, a, I don't know, but. Um, Try to hang on to the water when we have too much, like store it somewhere so when we have a drought. I, I remember. But you, again, you need the system for delivery yeah, system. and I think so. that, that's been the biggest barrier yeah. I've heard. I mean, Michael Doctor, I remember many years ago, said he'd rather, um, he'd rather ha have, he have, he'd rather have less water because then he can control the amount of water right. that yeah. he. And I've heard something similar from mm -hmm. farmers. That, that way they have some control. You can, control. You can exactly. add it, but you can't take it away. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Oh, right. Like too much can just ruin you, like yeah. as we know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I also think, I mean, flood or just extreme rainfall, it's not just the way it damages the crops that are like in the path of the water. It also can increase disease pressure, um, and that can affect farms for years, years. decades. Right. So Sometimes the diseases go into the soil, yes. and it's really awful. I talk for a, it's so, a water yeah, for, disease. So, for example, that that's one of the for, worst. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, where? Phytophthora is a plant disease that affects like squash, um, cucumbers. cucumbers, that whole family of plants, and it can stay in the soil for decades. You go to pick up the squash and it'll actually flow through your hands. Yeah. Somebody just told me in the lobby of our, she built, she bought three watermelons at Stop and Shop oh. and she was walking in and two of them just disintegrated in her. Like they just yeah. disintegrated all over the lobby floor, oh, like no. just completely fell apart. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh. And that's, that's the that way it acts. Mm -hmm. It's really pretty awful to see it the first time I remember hearing about it. I was like, this can't be. It's, it's just not, terrible. Yeah. It's not yeah. dangerous to humans or anything. You can grow other crops that aren't in that same family. Um, but if but you have it a whole certainly crop limits, of squash planted. Yes. Right. It certainly limits your flexibility in terms of what you can use fields for. Yeah, yeah. It's, it can oh be pretty gosh. bad. But yeah, so water brings all sorts of other, like, um, See, that's the thing a lot of people don't understand. They just think, oh, well, so there's some extra water and some, mm -hmm. you'll need some drainage. And no. other, but water does bring a lot of diseases, yes. and that's really devastating to the So farmers. then farmers have to be out there testing their soil for all this stuff, right? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's a good yeah. soil-based test for that either. So sometimes you plant it and then you, you just don't it. know until it happens and to you. And he grows, like, mm -hmm. right, if you grow a lot so of squash. Has he had that happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like lately? Even today. So he oh. can't On cucumbers and other so, things. Uh -huh. So he will have to rotate off. But right. you know, mm -hmm. there are some farmers where they just don't have such a diverse rotation right. yeah, where you can switch out mm -hmm. and get something that'll grow. Yeah. Well, so, you don't have the land base, you know, if you are right. a tiny farm, you don't right. have that much flexibility. Yeah. So one other thing I'm curious about. Um, what are you seeing sort of on the next generation of farmers? Are you seeing lots of people very excited and jumping into farming or not so much? Oh boy, that is such a great question. It's funny, our executive director, Phil Corman, is leaving CESA at the end of August. There's our job posting <laughs> right oh, wow. there. Uh, he, well, he was <laughs> Phil down low. Yeah, yes. Phil was in that. Um, so we've been having a lot of conversation. He's been at CESA for 16 years, and we've been having all these conversations about like what's changed, you know, like sort of reflections on um, what 
challenges have shifted for local farms, what's different for CESA, just, I don't know, it's been a moment of like looking back. Um, and I, you know, this is all so anecdotal, like I don't have stats to back it up. Um, but I do think that there, it feels like there was sort of a cohort of people about my age who, um, you know, were in school maybe when the omnivores dilemma came out, yeah. sort of like when the first wave of like mainstream public discussion about, there was a bit of like a, a, a new back to the land. The resurgence, um, absolutely. I agree. Generation. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Like I grew up in Providence and my childhood best friend lives on a farm in Maine and I work for CESA and it's like, we both grew up in a, a small city, but like we didn't have agricultural backgrounds. Why? <laughs> like it's just a generational thing. Um, and my anecdotal sense is that um, there are really heavy barriers to getting into farming. Uh, the land values are outrageous around make here. It, yes, make it impossible um, for someone who is not coming in with you know family wealth. Or I mean, there are certainly people who have figured out how to access farmland, but not without a lot of like public or you know community connections and a lot of work and a lot of um support from various places so anyway not to say it's only family money that makes it possible but you know if you want to be a first generation farmer there are really high barriers to making that happen um but i do think that my sense of sort of the younger people who are entering the, the workforce now and figuring out what they want to do with their lives is that there continues to be a lot of interest in social justice issues, thinking about food justice, um, racial equity in the food system. There certainly is a lot of interest in thinking about climate change and how we're going to manage that. Um, and I, I think that a lot of younger people still do definitely connect agriculture and the local food world with those larger global issues that we're kind of all grappling with. Not necessarily because, like, working on a local farm is the solution to any of them, but um, it's a very sort of immediate and localized way. Well, it is to in be a way because a, a farm is connected to markets, mm -hmm. and and where the markets are, I mean, there are food deserts and stuff. That, yeah. I mean, I I love it when there's like an article in the paper that says, you know, so and so opening up a grocery store in this hell neighborhood of Holyoke where there's nothing, you know, mm -hmm. or it's like, yay. Well, and the Boston Globe does quite a bit of reporting about that. There are lots I mean, of I mean, it really is all there. connected. Yeah. yeah, it really is, yeah. But I do think that it's pretty challenging for people to, you know, the pathway where you work on a farm and then gain expertise and then buy a farm. I mean, that's a pretty tricky road <laughs> to go because... Yeah, I, I mean, it, it makes sense. It's just financially so Financially hard. very, very difficult. You know, yeah. I teach eighth graders, and I have now for many years, and I don't know if I've ever had a student of mine say, I want to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. And I ask a lot because they are right at this intersection of deciding what they want for high school. Yeah, and they're and having life. kids, so they know... It, there's it's, many kids they now. See it around them. There are many kids who are going to Vogue Tech School. It's yeah. been an amazing change in the last four or five years. It's incredible to see the shift toward yeah. there, which is wonderful. Yeah. In so many ways, where kids are picking, like, I want something and I can get a job right away, mm -hmm. and it'll be a good job, and it's important. Mm -hmm. But I just don't ever hear kids say, mm -hmm. I want to be a farmer when I grow up. Yeah. Well, and it is, I mean, you know, there certainly are farms that many farms where the generation that's farming is aging and they don't necessarily have an next generation that wants to take over. I mean, I don't know, I can also think of so many people who like have come back and taken on the family farm and um, breathe whole new life into it, you know? Like you well, look at- Yeah, well cars, you mentioned that. Yeah. And there, there's a perfect example. Yeah, yeah. and Warner Farm yeah. just up the road with Mike's Maze and all of that, yeah. like that's the new generation that's making all that happen. Well, and Barstow's and Barstow's, how they're investing yeah. in their, right. in their farm. Yes, yeah. I, Barstow's is like, I, I feel like the, the next generation is so yeah. passionate. <laughs> it's wonderful to what see. What are they, seventh generation? I think that's right. Which is really oh unusual. Yeah. It's hard for farms to get much beyond three generations. Yeah. They're seventh. So it's both things. I mean, yeah. I know, you know, there are certainly farmers where 
there isn't really a next generation and it's because the kids have seen how hard their parents work and are like that's not what I want for myself you know it's this is a really hard life um and then there are also farms where the next generation is like this is for me you know we just had this is not in Hadley but Tessa um from Diamond Farm up in Wendell. Do you yeah, know yeah, them? yeah, the egg farm. She, yeah, yeah, she Chicken came and farm. told a story at, we do the, we do a storytelling event at the Academy of Music each year, and it's like, people tell their true life stories about food and farming. Oh, um, how cool. It's called Field Notes. That's, that's it's, a great It's thing. lovely, yes, you should all come. Um, we're gonna do <laughs> it in we February. Should. But um, yeah, she told a story about like, just some wild day on the farm, and I don't know, it was like pouring rain, and the, like the ch- turkeys were, I don't remember, just like some bonkers thing, and she was like, this is the place for me, <laughs> like just a realization, it was so great, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that my sort of current take is also like, the last couple of years, COVID required so much of local farmers, like figuring out, it came right at the beginning of the season, figuring out how they were going to like keep everything moving, keep their staff safe, figure out how they were going to sell their products when like everything was changing constantly. That was a huge lift just like, and it didn't stop for two years. It was just like, they did so much. And I think so many people looked to them, looked to local farms for food when it felt like, um, we may not have. Yeah. Well, and here we are a local committee. But it'll be interesting to see how national politics has yeah. an impact. Right. Yeah. And the farm bill has no sign of mm. of progressing. I mean, we're just sort of riding on the old farm bill. <coughs> um, Bless you. Yeah. Bless you. Yeah. So I don't know. Right. It just feels like the last couple of years have been hard with supply chain issues and inflation and COVID and really rough sea like yeah. weather because of climate change. It's just it's been a rough five years for a lot of farms so I don't know I have a jumble of thoughts about like no, 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 but it's important to hear and I'm so glad you accepted our invitation to yeah. join us yeah, because so this much. is how we build our strength learning from you yeah. and others well it's been interesting to just have the conversation and yeah, know what it's you. on your minds too yeah yeah, yeah. thanks yeah should I duck out? How do these normally work? Um, it's totally up to you. Yeah. You can stay, stay and listen you are to welcome us to stay yeah. Or it's fine if you duck out. <laughs> it's, you, it's your call. Yeah, there's no reason. Okay, well, it's, yeah. it's probably been a long day. So. <laughs> I mean, we went to a meeting sure. last night, did our spiel, and then left. Okay, well, so. I think maybe I will do that. Yeah. But anyway, it was really nice Thank to meet you, you all. Good to meet you. Thank um, you very much. And yeah, yeah let, let's figure out how to stay in touch. If yes. Uh-huh. And okay. yeah. certainly with my court, I just keep mentioning Stephen, but um, I think he's a great resource, like as you talk to farmers or anyone. Good. So. Great. So the next thing coming up is something that has really been more of an issue over the last few years, insurance impacts of climate change, and impact, uh, information from Melissa Geary. So she works for the Horace Mann Insurance Company. How do I know Horace Mann? Because I'm a teacher. And Horace Mann will actually give discounts for teachers and they serve teachers. And so she, as an insurance agent, has been researching these topics and shared some of this information with me to pass on to you. So this is really intriguing from the New York Times. I hope I can open it up. There you go, natural disasters. Um, So do home insurance premiums. Uh, Oh, that's so annoying. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, hang on. Go away. Sometimes if you click up there. I'm open. Let me try to Trying to tell you you don't have access. Well, I'm seeing if I can just go back. Okay. Um, darn it. I was hoping I'd have more luck with this. And show okay, this well, article. Okay. Oh, you, you can continue, continue with what? Google. I, I try can. continue. Okay. I can see if that works. Oh, I don't know. It's probably under a different account. Oh. Darn it. Uh, this is a great article. It, well, I have. So, yeah. Go ahead, Kathy. I think I have a subscription to the Times. You can try it with my Well, email. I have it through a different email on this. Just yeah. okay. okay. Anyways, what they have found out is there are extremes with how 
rates are going up. And Massachusetts is actually not on the biggest um, continue with work or school sign up. I have a single sign up. I'll just try. So Massachusetts isn't so bad, but there are other states like Florida, Texas, California, uh, where it's just been awful. Uh, and you're seeing the rates just going sky high. Or you can't get coverage. Or you can't get coverage. Like That's what's happening in, in Florida. Florida. Yeah. They have homeowners insurance, okay. but it doesn't cover any wind damage. Uh, which is what they get. If they were going to get any, that's what it would be. Um, so it's just a big issue with how this is changing and it's less of an impact in Massachusetts but again in Florida and California there are people who are no longer able to get homeowners insurance I don't even know how they get financing from banks if they can't get insurance for their account um, let me go to the second thing and see if I can get get into that okay so from NBC News So, unexpected places where extreme uh, weather threatens homeowners' pocketbooks. Homo, uh, uh, home insurance to exit markets. Many Americans are already facing rising premium and lower home value. Tens of millions of people could join them. So, I have family in Beaufort, South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina. Schools usually open around the end of July or early August. I don't know how this is impacting the Charleston schools, and they're enormous, and they're sort of county-based. But well, this, is, early. this is just devastating. Well, it, you know, normally they're open by now, but I don't know if they get held up because... Why do they open so early? Any it's just their tradition. Uh -huh. You know, we usually open around Labor Day or a little bit before, but their tradition is to open end of July or early August. And then they also get out a month earlier. Uh -huh. So, um, hold on, let's see if I can get down here. So one in four American homes might be overvalued. 39 million properties are vulnerable to disasters, to fire, to wind, and to flood. Wow. 10 million, almost 11 million people in America live in a county where 100% of the homes are vulnerable to insurance correction. This is just stunning with what's happening. So I have seen my insurance rates change over time. Mm -hmm. We've been in our house for 20 years, and the first couple of years, and remember we have a house and a half, we have an apartment on one side, we paid about $600. Our last insurance bill was about $3,200. Uh, $3, so it's amazing how it's, well, doubled and doubled again because the insurance companies can't afford to lose this kind right, of money and all of that. So I'm just wondering if there are any thoughts that you all have on insurance, what you've seen, if any of you do live in flood zones or things like that. I don't know. Have My you thought seen is sympathy for folks who want to buy a home in these places. Like yeah. the article just said, the value of that property unless it's a cash buy. Yeah. That's it. So again, you're eliminating people from the housing market unless the loan companies are going to change, but why are they ever going to take a risk on something that's uninsured? Yeah. So well, it's a big catch-20. And not knowing who pays the bills in your family, but have you seen ins your insurance oh, rates? Oh yeah, we got a little letter, it might have been last year even, when the bill came explaining why it went up by X percentage because of all the claims being made. Not me. Yeah, they can't afford to lose right. money. That's not their business. Right. Uh, Marion, how about you? Um, my insurance has gone up not, not too, too much. Uh, but I have, you know, but I, but I think in places where there's been a lot more, we're seeing a lot more natural disasters. Florida, California, just exists. So isn't this amazing with this chart? Mm -hmm. And I'm so sad I couldn't show you the New York Times article. I just, I don't so have that blue, login. So the blue is percentage oh, of see. properties at risk. Yeah. And if you take a look, 
So you see places. I'm surprised, like the the Midwest isn't a darker color with all the tornadoes and stuff. Yeah, there. but it's also so vast with this um, area. But look at this all along the coastline from the Cape, all of hurricanes. Florida, which yeah, is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But Florida, Florida, I think it's um, highest mountains like 200 feet. So right, you know they right. don't escape all into Texas, and then you have California and some of these places who deal with some right. wildfires. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It's just incredible yeah. with how. This is happening now. If you take a look at Massachusetts, I mean, we're pretty much 0% of the risk, but still. Yeah. You know, we don't have to watch this necessarily. You all have this video through the agenda yeah. in here, but it is amazing how it's impacting this. And this is a fairly well, recent What's gonna happen story. is migration. That, that's one of the things mm -hmm. that climate scientists keep talking to us about is that maybe not this year, but over time, as these areas are so degraded, people can't live there anymore. I mean, we're seeing, yeah. we're seeing a lot more people moving, you know, and these are both people who, you know, have money and some who are impoverished and right. just cannot live in their, you know. Well, when it, an area becomes unlivable, like, yeah. I mean, there are islands now that know, like, within the next three years, we're going to have to move the entire population somewhere else because it's going to be underwater. Well, and again, we're really lucky in Massachusetts, and we're really lucky here that we're not battling this. I see the whole state of Florida is nearly 100% at risk. That's really Well, that's scary. what I'm saying. I think for us, like in areas that aren't suffering directly from the weather or the climate, we are the places where people are going to move to. Well, and that's why this whole Smart Growth Hadley issue is coming up, because we need to protect our farmland. But we also need affordable housing. We need affordable housing. So they're talking about, like, it's like the Route 9 corridor yeah. is kind right. of what they're talking about. Right. And there is land concentrate. Land more of the housing yeah. and hopefully more affordable housing too. Well, yeah. all the more important to complete that survey and to get everybody's opinion. Right. Yeah. What they're saying is that people growing up in this town can no longer afford to live in this town. Right. Right. They're, they grew up in this town, their families. Right. 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 Or anywhere, or, I mean, yeah. Amherst is horrible, Amherst North Amherst is really expensive. Yeah, no, the whole area. Right. That we all, all the towns need affordable housing. And I don't mean to show you all my emails. We're not um, really looking. <laughs> this is, is this the one? Oh, I hope it is. Come on. Yeah, it's a bad situation. Continuance, Jack. I don't know if it's going to get through there. Oh, this is a good one. So I thought that committee also was looking at whether or not no. the town administrator's role should change. Oh, I don't know anything. Oh, you're not wondering? No, no, no. I'm kind of all right. interested. So this one's not, this is the one that was showing all the different red lines and showing the, the changes over time, but it, it did not work. Okay. Um, and there we go. And so it's let's, yeah, and so let's move on to Solar Update Senior Center. Mm -hmm. Kathy, do you want to share the news? Sure. Um, so between Michael and Jane, they uh, uh, got some uh, three bids from, uh, who was it? Valley Solar, Northeast Solar, and PV Squared, Squared for solar on the, on the senior center. <coughs> and last night at the select board meeting, uh, Jane said, you know, Valley Solar is the best, is the lowest bid and, and other good things about the bid. And the select board oh, voted to approve it, and like it's a green light. So this will be a system that's about 90 kWh. So per for perspective, my house has a system that's about 5 kWh. Now you How might many? Nine? 90. 90. 90. They're going to put 90 as much kWh. As the so that's okay. the size of the system. So this is pretty amazing. Now some of you might say, so where's the money coming from? from the original funding for this um, building, they always had designs to put solar on here. So they've had the money all along. So this is not something that's going to increase our taxes. We're not gonna have to pay more. This is something that they budgeted in 
and now we will large the town will largely pay the electric bill for this with solar panels on the roof of this building. So that's great. Yeah. All right. Um, here, if you start on the Green Communities Grant, I can continue. Okay. Why don't you start? Okay. So uh, we have been working with Chris Desjardins from Hadley Public Schools. He's the business manager. And he has gotten some um, initial estimates for weatherization at the school, like spraying in closed cell insulation and also um, some insulated doors. And that would be covered by our green community grant. But there's more. So right now, well, and now the next step is to send those quotes to Eversource to see what kind of rebates will get applied. And then we'll know how much it's gonna really cost us. So then our um, green communities, uh, Western Mass Rep, Chris Mason, who's in on the emails about you know, using the grant money, brought it to our attention that um, incentives for upgrading to LED lighting will no longer be available after this year. So if any of our municipal buildings still need upgrades, like do it now uh, so we can make use of the rebate. So <clears throat> I got in touch with Gary Berg and you know said, which of our buildings still need it? And I guess they're like, I think a lot of work, my impression is a lot of work has been done in town hall, public safety, like all the buildings except for the sewer department, nothing's been done. And there are four outdoor lights on poles that need to be upgraded. So he's gonna get bids for that work. And then I encouraged him to, but in our energy reduction plan, for each of those other municipal buildings, it still says LED lighting. Yeah, you know, I think that was just standard something to review. At oh, all I, places. I don't yeah. know, because they put it. Anyway, so I encouraged him, like, whatever LED lighting we need in any of our buildings, let's do it now while we can still get the savings, because after, after 2024, we'd have to pay full price. So. so hopefully by our next meeting, we'll have more concrete numbers and the select board knows that we are moving forward with this. Right, I got an automatic email back from Gary. He's on vacation until the 24th, okay. so it'll be a little while, but hopefully we'll hear something soon. All right, on the next one, we need your help with this. Nick, if it's possible, can you pan over to the signs? Yes. So this is Susan Duncan, seventh grade class in Hadley. You want help holding those up? Uh, you know, I'll just hold them up briefly. This is the map of Hadley. Somebody did a nice job, very colorful. Keep Hadley clean. Again, keeping with the theme. Go green. Again, the seventh graders did this at the tail end of their year. Um, I covered it in urethane to make sure it's protected for at least a few years. This is all plywood. It won't hold up forever, but it'll hold up for a while. So the yes, no, the save the earth and then the no littering. Um, I would like no littering to go on North Maple Street near the UMass Hadley Farm, just because no, there's so much trash that's put there. Yeah. But we have four other signs. Do you have any suggestions? Jane has been good about connecting with DPW and they, the DPW has been wonderful about placing these signs around town. Hopefully you see them when mm -hmm. you're driving. What about the other very part of nice to see? I have mm -hmm. to say, they yeah. really just kind of send a message as you're driving along mm -hmm. or riding along or whatever. That the kids are. Yeah, yeah and it's just, I think it, yeah. yes, they, they are. Well, I didn't participate in trash day, but where, where do you see, a, where was there a ton of trash? It's trash all I mean, around which, town. Which streets that people cleaned up? And there's trash sort of everywhere. I mean, should there be one on Mount Warner? What are the, like, along 47, definitely. Mm -hmm. What yeah. about Mount Warner's Adam? probably a good idea, or North Maple Street. Uh, and yes. South Maple. Uh -huh. okay. What about Bay Road? Are there any out there? Or no, should that's there good. Be? Mm -hmm. So South Maple, that's a good one. Route 47, and you said Bay Road? Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything well, up in North Hadley? Uh, like on well, there's one there? on the top of Mount Warner. Um, but there's not a lot in North Hat. There's one right um, on the Sunderland line. Uh -huh. 
What about uh, like the inter like the T intersection of Forty Seven and uh, Mount Warner? Well, I was going to say like Commons Road or Shattuck. Uh, it's not Shattuck. Uh, Commons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they're, they're I think like I love the one when I'm on Rocky Hill and you get to Forty Seven and it's right there. I just I love that. So one, two, three, four. Uh, so, so far we have one on North Maple by the um, Hadley Farm for UMass, one on South Maple. We have Route 47 in Cummins at that T. We have Bay Road. We could put one. Um, I don't travel through the main intersection very often. Is there one there? No. Yeah, that, anything on Route 9? Okay, I mean, no, Route 9. <coughs> What were you going to say? I was going to say, um, any, how about as you're heading on 47 towards South Hadley? No. Maybe something okay. along there is good. Mm -hmm. You know, near Barstow's. Yeah. Okay, near oh, Barstow's. <coughs> okay. Oh, well, there's that marina over there. Yeah. Yeah. Are yeah. there other signs that need to be like refurbished? Or we um, so I, in, thanks for asking. In the last month I've gone around and I have uh, repainted oh, some of them, have. but I will tell you after about seven years or so, yeah. a lot of them are breaking down. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, so but it's an ongoing really project every it year at school, it, it's, you know? it's, like, it's been really good that Susan does this with yeah. her students and it's also great I mean clearly they take it seriously mm -hmm. yeah so all right so maybe we can what keep class in. is it what what's for seventh grade? graders seventh grade. It's just science at science the very tail end of the year it's a good yep. end of the year activity. yeah for sure fun yeah and it's such a nice thing to have in town we might have to wait a year for route nine but uh, that idea of 47 near Barstow's is a good one. All right. So we're up to 6.1 hazardous well, waste. Well, Route 9, I don't mean to interrupt, okay. but like where the strip where all those restaurants are and stuff, like, is that a good place? You mean where like there's Texas so much Roadhouse? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Would the sign be lost there? Yeah, that's true. There's yeah. also a lot of, still a lot of construction. Exactly. Right and what we, you know, right. we even have one by Home Depot that's sitting in, in a puddle. In the water. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Unfortunately. Right. There's no but, point in putting one right. up where there's construction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks All for right. that. And we're up to six point, uh, for new topics, we're up to 6.1 hazardous waste day. So, Kathy? Right, then. So I sent a flyer to yeah, all of you guys. That. Did you get it? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So you know, a hazardous household hazardous waste collection day is on the seventh. You have to pre-register to uh, participate. I don't know. That, that's all. I was like, what is pereg? Pre oh, pre-read. Pre-reg. Pre-registration. Pre Got, Got it. I was like, pre-reg is required. required. Got it. Yeah. Take a moment. Okay. So that, that's it. I yeah. sent you guys all the flyers. So, and it's on Facebook, and Jennifer put it on the town website. Okay. And I don't know, every year we have about 10 to 15 people from Hadley that participate. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, one thing, I'm going to bring this up to Steve Taliga, who he's the um, Amherst Solid Waste Director, and he organizes it every year. There's, to participate, for Hadley, Shutesbury, and Pelham residents, it's a minimum, it, it costs you $25 to even participate. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that allows you, I think it's, uh, it's three pounds or 30, yeah. uh, three gallons, I think, of household waste. Well, what if you only have like four fluorescent? I'm going to break bring up to him is there any way that people can participate when they only have a little bit a sliding scale yeah yeah i mean based on what you have if you, you could also what if you were to like join with another family or well two? that that's what some people yeah. do yeah. actually um so yeah you know, how is like, amherst underwritten like the amherst residents don't have that fee because it's embedded in some in the some taxes. something in, in oh, Amherst. Right. So it's not a grant or that's anything a good that question. we could try. Yeah. No, and as it is, it's, well, this, a lot of people don't understand that the stuff that gets turned in, this is the really nasty stuff that you cannot put in the trash. Right. They can't take it at the transfer station. It's all the really toxic mm -hmm. stuff. And it's very expensive to mm -hmm. recycle. Mm -hmm. So 
but even for each of the towns. I, people sh I mean, I don't know. I, I'm just money. saying, yeah, I, well, what money, struck me was $25 is no big deal if you've got, like, the back of your truck is full of stuff you've been right. saving up for a few years. It's like, you know, all the crap. And um, then it's worth it. But if you well, no, because then you pay per barrel. If you read the fine print, I, oh, there's right, more. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Yeah. The fee increases. But, yeah, okay. there's up there's up charges. Right, and already the town pays. Well, it would be five hundred dollars for Hadley to participate, mm -hmm. or four hundred because I always volunteer. Yeah. So, and I asked him. I'm like, why do residents have to pay? Because it's really yeah. expensive. This is super expensive to do. And I'm like, okay. So when people do come, you know, I mean, last year we were open from 9 to 12, and it was steady. Like, I think we had 350 people come through there. Well, you know, I think my trash bill from USA is something like 600 for a whole year now, which is, it's stunning. It, trash is expensive. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to process and well, that's clean why up and all of that. Yeah, try not to have much. Yeah. Like be careful right. about what you use. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, I try to avoid pack. The only thing in my trash now is packaging uh -huh. that you can't recycle. Like what sliced ham well, comes in. in or, Walmart know. and some other places will take some of the packaging, some of the plastic packaging and things like that. I didn't know they have take a place up front. Packaging. I know that they'll, they'll take, take a plastic wrap, for example, that Amazon would send a book in. Right. They'll take that. Well, and, and Whole Foods will take all that Amazon packaging, but they, like, I was putting everything in that bin, and now there's a sign on it saying, "This is just for Amazon packaging, not your bread bags and your <laughs> like single they use." They used to. I yeah. yeah. They used to take bags. Because those those bags, I'm still putting them in, I have like a thing in my closet with all that kind of stuff, even though it should be separated. Now I will separate it. Those are recyclable. And I don't, I guess they can go in with, well, in Hadley. You know how at Big Y they used to have the thing by the entrance where you could recycle your single-use bags? Do they still have I don't I think so. I don't think so. Yeah, so what are we going to do with? Well, it's a good thing we have a plastic reduction act in place. Today. No, but but for the things that do come in plastic bags that can be recycled, where do we take well, them? We take them to Walmart. That's one place. That Walmart we still will yeah. take single-use bags. Uh, well, they'll take different types of pack of packaging for plastics. Okay. So. Yeah. I should know that. All right. What's this planting native wildlife? Okay, so I wish I had thought about this before. So all on Route 9, you know, where they're doing all the, mm -hmm. what made me think about it was the, the part that's finished and seeing that a master or somebody had reseeded. And I thought, a missed really? opportunity. Yes. So I thought, well, wait, there's a whole, the whole section that they're doing now. So why not see if we could get them to plant you know, native wallflowers there instead of grass. So what is that organization, Hampshire Hamden Conservation, or yeah. that helped? Conservation District. Yeah, they, they, did they provide the plants? Well, they provide 50% of the plants. So they actually like had the a program at the library where if you signed up, they would come in, offer a design for your house, and offer you half the plants for free, and then the other half you purchase. Wait, you guys did that in your backyard? We did. Anyway, so I, I called or I emailed them to see if, you know, along Route 9 was something that they would be interested in getting involved in. And she emailed me back and she said, no, that's not what we do. But contact Mass DOT because they are the ones mm -hmm. that would do that. And she sent me this particular link, which I went to. But they have a complete protocol for doing it. Oh, they right. call it the Northeast Wildflower Mix. And a whole like page of exactly they call it revegetating, what like when they've torn something up, mm -hmm. like they're going to revegetate it, mm -hmm. and um, so I think if everybody agrees that this would be like a nice thing to, I think it would be beautiful, and I'm it's also very low maintenance. Imagine where 
what's, well, what's five? you're talking this, about so the where they're doing the done? widening what ended up happening in that section where it's finished already you'll notice that um, so the streets wider then there's a median you know there's a strip that's dirt which now has been seeded with grass seed I guess and then the sidewalk mm -hmm. so it's that strip right there so it's around the rail trail okay if okay. you're wondering where the split okay. is so the yeah. other stuff missed opportunity right. but from here on you know right. how Shelburne has the bridge of flowers how they could have the route nine of flowers right. it right. could have well, and you'll see like I don't know if you guys are on Facebook or wherever like I get things in my feed because I'm into all this stuff where it'll sh it'll show like along highways right. where right. it's all yeah. wild yeah. instead of being grass it's some right. you know there's department. a funny name for it. I've heard it. I've heard it called Hell Strip. Oh, it's the Hell Strip, and it's where and you can. It's a really good place to just plant wildflower seed. Well, and it's also low maintenance. It is. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, um, if everybody, I it's guess we should down. vote on. I think we should. I, I think the next step would be to go to the select board and get their approval. Sure. And then, would you offer some sort of simple motion that we can act on? Right. Well, let me just finish, and then once they say okay, then I'll call Mass DOT. Sure. And I'd say we want you to do this. And it, this is considered low maintenance because you don't have to mow it that often. Right. You let the flowers grow. Right. 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 Think how pretty it'll be, like black-eyed Susans, and I'd like to see some trees along there too. <sighs> That's the thing. Let's start for flowers. The thing is, plant. I mean, planting a tree in a patch of dirt that small is really it's stressful for the tree. Right. It's rough to have till it gets going. Well, it's too. It's very hard for it to get going because the street is there. So well, and then also a, it upsets the sidewalk. That's why well, wildflowers are right. so easy yeah, because right. you're not Streets. dealing with roots Streets. and other things. Take work, you have to yeah. prune them. I mean, look around the sure mall. Branches like, are not like falling. half the maples that are on well, the way they're putting the mulch like up the trunk of the tree now. It's like, are you trying well, to kill the tree? So but anyway. why don't you put forward the mulch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, like, uh, anyway, yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, I move that we uh, pursue the idea of wildflowers along. But revegetating. I, I'll second that. Along Route Nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Good. Hey. So this last one um, is something worth worth looking at. So, you know, I wish I had better news to report from the state. Well, read the articles the we've sent. Yeah. Okay. So the state was really pushing a climate bill, a number of climate bills. And they put together something. Well, it's a big climate bill with a lot of stuff yes. in it. So they put together something to supercharge clean energy adoption in the state. There is no planet fee, and this is coming from the mass legislature. So here's some of the ideas. Protecting ratepayers from high costs, like high costs of electricity and other things. Well, this was the whole siting thing. Um, well, no, that's coming up. The yeah. next one is doing siting so if you had a mega sized system of up to a hundred local communities can evaluate this if you had something bigger the state was going to take it on just to try to move it a little faster and forward this was something that was part of the bill making EVs accessible and expanding infrastructure so more charging stations decarbonizing building leading the way on green tech leading by example curving over reliance on natural gas and all of this so the senate passed this well, they the house passed, passed their this own. but when they tried to merge the plans with everything being rushed on july 31st they couldn't come together to do this so right now it's sitting in limbo and they're hoping that they'll retake it or re well, re-examine this in september well and they're going to work on it even yes. while the session, they're not in session. So look, these are some of the issues. But understanding we are a local committee, we cannot take on all the problems for the right. world right. and for the nation, right. a little bit for the state. But this is why I'm so glad that a few years ago, Bruce actually pushed the plastic reduction because the plastic reduction was part of the Senate and House 
bill, but it never got passed. So, so I'm, I'm glad Hadley did it because honestly, if you're waiting on the state, sometimes it takes a long, long time. Between now and the next meeting, if you can think about some of the other initiatives we should be taking on, please do. Okay. And look, we're continuing our work with a um, energy action plan and all of that. That's a big job. That's going to take a while. So that hasn't gone away. Well, I have an idea. And the landfill, and the landfill, um, you know, they're making some progress yeah. Yeah. with that. Yeah. And Michael has really taken the lead on that, and that's something. I, it's wonderful to report to you that the senior center yeah. is going to have solar. This is tremendous. So is, is it okay agenda-wise to bring up an idea for reducing plastic right now? We well, I'm saying think about it, and this is one thing you can have on. So we take turns setting up the agenda. Uh -huh. We often meet to set up the agenda. But that's one where for next month you don't have to have an on-the-spot answer. It's just too much to ask. But again, we are a local committee with local But actions. that's where things get done is locally. So we just need to for keep sure. going. For there sure. Are things we can do yeah. right here in Hadley to yeah. improve. You know, what's the saying? Think globally, act locally. Absolutely. You know, because do our part. if you look at what the seventh graders did, that's a local action, and it's something that really sticks out. I love driving by the Keep Hadley Clean sign every day on the Amherst Hadley line and seeing it. It's something that has an impact. Yeah. All right. All right. In June, in June, I sold all 17 compost bins that we had. Yay. There was like a run on compost <laughs> bins. Yeah. yeah. So that brings us to public comment. But again, um, you know, you have up to three minutes per person. Um, please confine comments to topics relevant to this committee. Look, this is America, and you have every right to say everything you want in public comments. But if you can keep it to local issues, all the better. So at this point, I ask if anybody has public comment. Tom, please. Uh, June. 2024, the petrodollar agreement with Saudi Arabia expired and was not renewed. The 50-year agreement is done. Any outstanding con as the outstanding contracts expire, new contracts will be entered into with less favorable terms to the United States. Uh, any environmentalists wishing for seven dollars a gallon of gasoline? and six dollars a gallon home heating oil. Maybe you'll get it this winter. The daily usage of oil in the United States is 19 million barrels a day. But there's no such thing as a barrel of oil. It's, it's just a measure. Technically it's 42 gallons. So 798 million gallons of oil are used in the United States daily. 60% of electricity is produced by fossil fuel. So our all-electric Hadley library is consuming a lot of barrels of oil. Big polluters in this country include the military and road construction. In the fake US economy, military road construction, landfill dumps, casinos make up a large portion of the economy. If pollution is so bad, all commercial firework displays should be banned immediately. All private jet planes should be surrounded. If the ocean levels are rising, and you just showed us the chart of the um, of hard to get insurance on the Cape. If the ocean levels are rising, and Boston and New York City are going to be under water, why are the feds in the state spending seven billion dollars to replace the bridges on Cape Cod? I would think uh, the Cape Cod would be underwater or it would be so, so swampland. As solar panels destroy more open space and the windmills off New York and New Jersey just disturb the whale's sonar and, the, and they beach themselves and the fiberglass debris washes up on the Nantucket beaches from the detached wave from the windmill. I question, maybe there are some big negatives to the renewable energy. 
maybe renewable, renewable energy is designed to fail and it is set, it is a setup to reintroduce, reintroduce nuclear power in the country. Um, locally, the landfill dump, I've seen the articles about the solar. My question is, what's the return on investment in terms of dollars and percentages? What's the payback in, in years? What are the risks? And who gets stuck with removing the panels either at the end of the useful life or when they become obsolete with different technology? Sunday, August 4th, 2024, the Springfield newspaper had a front page article about a former homeless comfort couple moving out of Massachusetts because they could not afford to live here. According to the Forbes advisor, Massachusetts has the second highest cost of living in the country, only behind Hawaii. When more rules and regulations are put into laws, you're just pushing up the cost of housing and the cost for the consumer. Maybe if we try real hard, Massachusetts can pass Hawaii and become the most expensive state in the union. One last note, they talked about affordable housing. Um, Massachusetts could have a thousand new rental units in six months without pounding one nail. Re relax the rental laws and give the landlord a level playing field and the rental units that are on the sideline now would be made available and help the little people that need affordable housing. Thanks, Tom. All right. So, no taker for next meeting. Next meeting is... So next meeting is scheduled for September 12th. I think I can do it. I'll, I'll do it. We'll, we'll, we'll do take it. We'll, turns. we'll alternate. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. We actually do something similar with the library trustees. We alternate, okay. and that works pretty well. So uh, with that said, um, I make a motion that we adjourn this meeting. I second that motion. Yes. yes. All right. And thank you again for bringing the computer. Oh, yeah.